On May 3, 1983, at approximately 8.15 p.m., 16-year-old Shelly Ann Bascu was last seen walking down the north side of Highway 16 in Hinton. She was leaving her boyfriend's brother's house in the Sunset Trailer Park, where she had been babysitting. Shelly lived about 6.5 kilometers or a 10-minute drive from the park. She called her mom at 8 p.m. telling her that she would be home in about 15 minutes, stating that a friend was going to drive her home from her boyfriend's brother's house. At 9 p.m., her mother received a call from Shelly's boyfriend asking to speak to Shelly Ann. Her mother knew right away that something wasn't right. She promptly called the RCMP in Hinton, but they refused to fill in a missing persons report until Shelly had been missing for 24 hours after her last sighting. So her family began their own search along the route she may have taken and found nothing. 24 hours after her last sighting, the police finally filed a missing persons report and believed her to be a runaway, despite of her mother's objections. On May 7, 1983, the police made a chilling discovery on the banks of the Athabasca River, just off Highway 40, about three miles from her family's home. The police found her jacket, a bra, pantyhose, a student card, and a library book that she had taken out of the library on May 3, 1983. After this, the police no longer treated the case as a runaway, but that foul play was indeed involved. The search was continued, however, it was hindered by the fact that Hinton and the surrounding area is remote, rugged, and forested for many kilometers. It seemed odd that Shelley was walking the 6.5 kilometers or 4 miles to her family home at 8 p.m. in the evening, especially after telling her mom that a friend was going to give her a lift. The RCMP did interview Shelley's boyfriend, but the transcript, which contains information on who the friend was that was giving Shelley a ride and why Shelley was not with her, was never released to the public. Her mom said that it was uncharacteristic for Shelley to walk that far at night when she could just pick up the phone and call home for a ride. Shelley's boyfriend revealed that Shelley started walking home before her friend arrived, but eyewitnesses say that they never saw her begin her walk in the first place. An eyewitness said that she was spotted walking towards her house and was carrying what looked like school books and had no intention on hitchhiking. Another eyewitness reported to seeing her get into a van with BC license plates near the area where she was last spotted. In 2010, the RCMP took another look into the case as part of the Highway of Tears investigation. When that produced zero new leads, her case was handed over to the Historical Homicide Unit, which has kept this case open until this day. In 2019, her family requested that police take another look into her case. New DNA was found on her clothing belonging to her killer. No match has ever been found. Shelly has now been missing for over 40 years. Muriel is 76 years old and she just wants peace. She and her husband Sandy are just so thankful that they had Shelly for 16 years. She was our baby and a bright and shining star of our lives. But that star was dimmed too soon. We will never know what it could have been. She wanted to be a teacher, but she never got to graduate or get married or have children or live the life she deserved. At the time of Shelly Ann's disappearance, she was 4 foot 11 inches tall and weighed between 80 and 90 pounds. She was wearing a burgundy velour sweater and a burgundy gray jacket, gray sneakers and blue jeans with a stripe down the side, a green emerald ring and opal earrings. Shelly today would be 56 years old. 24-year-old Alberta Williams was a member of the Gitskin tribe, lived a quiet life during her childhood. Her father drove logging trucks and her mom stayed home to care for her children. They were a very close-knit family. Alberta was known to be a kind and shy child and as she grew older became known as a caring person who loved life and viewed the world as a good place. However, her siblings found that she was too trusting and they were overprotective of her. As Alberta grew older, her and her sister would head to Prince Rupert and work in the canneries for a few months to make a lot of money. In 1989, she was 24 years old and engaged and living with her fiancé. She was in Prince Rupert finishing up her cannery job and preparing to head back home to attend college and work as a waitress. Friday, August 25th, marked the last day of work for her and her sister. They had planned to go to the pub with friends and family. The bar was located along 2nd Avenue West, near Highway 16, which cuts through the downtown area of Prince Rupert. Later in the evening, her brother Francis remembers getting a call from her asking him to come and party. He said that she sounded happy. 
She was enjoying her last night with friends and family. Claudia remembers Alberta laughing and enjoying herself at the pub called Bogies. The bar was crowded so the girls could not sit together. Claudia sat with friends and went over to check on her sister. She remembers the mood as a good one. Everyone was laughing, dancing and talking. At closing time, Claudia saw her sister outside the bar talking with friends. Alberta was trying to convince her to come to a house party. Claudia decided not to go and Alberta left with friends and some family members. The next morning, their mother, Rena, woke to find Alberta's bed still empty. She called Claudia and asked if Alberta was with her. Claudia assured her that she had probably stayed over at a friend's house. That afternoon, she still hadn't showed up at her mom's house. Rena began calling friends and family, but no one knew where she was. That evening, her mom called Lawrence and her son, but they assured her that Alberta would turn up. The next day, there was still no sign of Alberta. Lawrence and Rena went to the RCMP and filed a missing persons report. They told the police that this was unlike her and that she had a return ticket back to Vancouver where she was working and where her boyfriend lived, and she had failed to show up for it. An intensive search began. Three weeks later, on September 25, 1989, Alberta's body was discovered east of Prince Rupert on Highway 16. Hikers found her laying face down in a ditch, covered with shrubs and debris. There were signs of a violent struggle. Her body was clothed in only a blouse and bra. It was clear that she was a victim of a violent sexual assault. Claudia remembers that the night Alberta vanished that she was going to party at a man's house who was last seen with her. His wife and son had been out of town. This same man became evasive and uncooperative with police after her body was found. Alberta's cousin remembers seeing her in a black truck in Terrace, a town a half an hour from Prince Rupert. Alberta was last seen getting in this same truck highly intoxicated. That is the last time that she was seen alive. This case is still unsolved. Alberta's family took her home and buried her next to her sister in Gatanyo. Delphine Nichol was 15 years old when she was last seen on June 13, 1990. She was born in Smithers and raised on a nearby farm. She was an adventurous girl and an animal lover. Her father died when she was 11 and she went to live with her mother in the town of Telqua. Early in 1990, Delphine's mom became ill and she stayed with her uncle across the street while her mom spent four months in the hospital in Prince George. On the day that she disappeared, Delphine told her uncle that she was meeting up with some friends in Smithers. She hitchhiked there. It is a 15 minute drive along Highway 16. Hitchhiking between the two interconnecting towns was very common back then. While in Smithers, she met up with three of her friends and the group wandered around town most of the day into the evening. They ended up at the Mohawk gas station on the corner of Main Street and Highway 16. She asked her friends if they could spend the night at her mom's place, which the friends found strange because it was a school night. Delphine called her uncle at 10 p.m. to let him know that she was on her way home. The last time that she was ever seen, she was hitchhiking in the eastbound lane of Highway 16. Her family reported her missing, but the police were not as concerned as the family had hoped for, leaving the family to do most of the searching. After some time, a reward of $10,000 was offered for information about her disappearance. Tips did start to come in, including one from an employee at the Mohawk gas station where she was last seen. The employee reported seeing Delphine get into a red sports car. Another tip said that she ended up at a party in the rural area near Smithers. Neither of these tips led anywhere. Her uncle was investigated as well but he was eventually cleared. Delphine had curly shoulder length hair that was either light brown or black. She had brown eyes, healthy teeth, a light complexion, medium build, and she had a fracture in her right index finger. She had a scar on her right temple and a purple birthmark on her neck. She was last seen wearing a blue bleached denim Levi's jacket with white pockets sewn on the inside, white cotton ginny sweater, hot pink denim pants that were knee length, and LA gear running shoes, a black leather pouch style purse with fringes. Inside her purse was hairspray, a hairbrush, pictures, makeup, and an address book. Investigators suspect that she may be a victim of Bobby Jack Fowler. In 1994, Ramona Lisa Wilson was a 16-year-old girl living with her family in Smithers, B.C. She was part of the Gitskin Nations and the youngest of six children. 
She was known as a jokester with a bubbly personality and was well liked by everyone around her. Her mother, Matilda, remembers Ramona telling her that she wanted to be a psychologist and be the first in her family to attend university. June 11th was graduation weekend and there was a grad party. Teens were looking forward to the all-night parties with friends and fellow students. Matilda remembers Ramona being excited and looking forward to the evening. She was dancing and singing and getting ready to go out. Ramona left the house at 9.45 p.m. to meet up with her best friend Crystal Cranky. Ramona was seen talking to some neighbors before heading on her way. Crystal was attending her brother's grad and was planning on meeting Ramona afterwards at a dance in Hazleton, a town 70 kilometers from Smithers. However, Ramona failed to show up at the dance. Crystal wondered if she had decided to stop in and visit her boyfriend in Morristown, which is located halfway between Smithers and Hazleton. On Sunday morning, Ramona's boyfriend called her house looking for her. Matilda told him that she was still with Crystal. She was not with Crystal and she was not scheduled to work that day. On Monday, she failed to show up at school, nor her shift at Smitty's. Matilda went to the RCMP. They told her to give it some time, so Matilda started her own search, calling on friends and family, and driving around town. In the following week, Ramona's bank account was untouched along with her possessions and latest paycheck. The RCMP began their search at this time. A reward was set up for $10,000 for any information as to her whereabouts. On April 9, 1995, two teens were four-wheeling in an area off Yelich Road just north of Highway 16 behind the Smithers Airport. They discovered Ramona's body in the woods and it was 11 months after she had gone missing. Alongside her body lay yellow rope and nylon cables. The clothing found were her leggings, purple sweatshirt, but her shoes were never found. Rumors swirled that she had attended a house party or a party in the fields near the Smithers Airport and that she was involved with an altercation with men in a truck. The RCMP followed up on these tips and nothing became of them. Ramona's sister, Brenda, organizes a yearly memorial walk for her in the month of June. They walk along the highway for Ramona and other missing and murdered young women. Roxanne Thiera was born in 1978 in Manitoba. However, she spent her early life in the foster care system in Quinell, BC. According to her foster mom, Mildred Thiera, she was a very quiet and well-behaved child. She was happy and bubbly and sweet. As Roxanne grew older, she began to hang around with a rougher crowd. She started skipping classes and rebelling. When she turned 12 years old, she was detained in a youth detention center for a petty offense. It was during this detention that she met another girl named Crystal. According to Crystal, Roxanne was naive, scared, and innocent. This period of incarceration had a lasting effect on her. A family member describes it as the worst thing that ever happened to Roxanne. After her release from the detention center, she hit a downward spiral. Prince George serves as a hub city in the north. This city is where Roxanne spent a lot of her time. In 1993, Roxanne had started using drugs and was rarely home. By 1994, she started spending more time in the streets in Prince George doing more drugs and falling into prostitution. She was only 15. Through it all, Roxanne stayed in contact with her foster mother, occasionally coming home or phoning every few days. She told her mom that she wanted to turn her life around and in late June, she made an appointment to enter a drug rehab program. Roxanne told her mother that she wanted to go into rehab, return to school, and fulfill her dream of becoming a fashion designer. On June 27, 1994, Roxanne left her mother's home in Quinell to collect her belongings in Prince George. It happened to be Canada Day weekend. Roxanne decided to remain in Prince George. The last sighting of Roxanne was during Canada Day weekend when she told a friend that she was going to meet a customer in the downtown core. Mildred spent the following month searching for her, contacting friends and asking family to help with the search. She was eventually reported missing and on October 17, 1994, her body was found on the side of Highway 16 just east of Burns Lake which is about 200 kilometers west of Prince George. According to the RCMP, they believe she was killed elsewhere and then brought by someone who was familiar with the area. Roxanne was the second indigenous girl to be murdered along Highway 16 that year. Ramona Wilson disappeared from Smithers in June 1994. Ramona and Roxanne had a friend in common, Crystal. The girl, Roxanne, met in detention. Crystal was also one of the last people to see Daphne Nicole, another girl that vanished from Smithers in 1990.
The police questioned Crystal about all three girls, however, there was nothing to indicate anything other than a coincidence. In 2004, a provincial court judge, David William Ramsey, was convicted of sexual assault for crimes committed in Prince George from 1992 to 2001 during his tenure as a judge. His victims were children aged 12 to 16. They were mostly Indigenous. Ramsey would pay these children and drive them to remote areas around Prince George and assault them. On one occasion, he slammed a child's head into the dashboard until she bled and then sexually assaulted her. On another occasion, he left a child on the side of the road stripped naked and threatened to kill her if she told anyone. He thankfully was sentenced to seven years in prison, not enough if you ask me, and he died of cancer in prison in 2008. Ramsey was never named a suspect or linked to any murders or disappearances along Highway 16. The outrageous abuse of authority and his propensity for children that are vulnerable and mostly indigenous is a complete miscarriage of justice. It is horrifying. Alicia Germain. Alicia is remembered affectionately as a child by her mom who said that she loved to sing and act and was a happy and loving girl. She was born a member of the First Nations in Prince George. Due to the tumultuous time in her life, coupled with her parents' separation, she began to act out. Her mom remembers her as a sensitive girl who, although put on a hard exterior, was still soft deep down inside. At age 12, Alicia ran away from home. A Prince George youth worker recalled Alicia as tough and independent and someone who didn't fit well into group homes or foster homes. Her mother tried to get her off the streets, but didn't know how. Living on the street, she eventually became addicted to drugs and was sexually exploited. Near the end of 1994, Alicia was trying hard to turn her life around. She was trying to quit drugs and wanted to return to high school. On Friday, December 9th, the Prince George Friendship Centre was throwing their annual Christmas party for street kids who, for a day, are able to enjoy a turkey dinner and a dance and receive a gift. Approximately 150 kids turned out. A youth worker recalls Alicia having fun. They spoke and she asked the worker to save her a present because she was just stepping out with her cousin and that she would return soon. Alicia never returned. At 11 p.m. that very night, three teens were walking behind Haldi Road Elementary School, which is located on the outskirts of Prince George and in a forested area off of Highway 16. It was there that they discovered Alicia's body. She had been stabbed to death. The last known sighting of Alicia was on the sidewalk downtown. Alicia was murdered less than six months after her friend Roxanne Thiera disappeared. The police released a sketch of a suspect, but no leads were ever received. There was also female DNA found at the crime scene, but there has never been a match so far. Alicia's family is still searching for answers.